and it is time to talk about isolation levels and memory optimized tables in SQL Server. Welcome to the webcast. I am recording this and I will attempt to publish this after uh, the webcast. I'll put a link in the quiz letter as well as the follow up email. So fingers crossed that it goes well and that that recording is successful. So first off, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I'm talking about isolation levels and end memory OLTP. So big picture, what is end memory OLTP in SQL Server? This is a entirely new form of how data can be stored, accessed, and manipulated in SQL Server that was written in SQL for, well, it was released first in SQL Server 2014. The name implies that what's special about it is that the data is in memory, but that, you know, we use memory for other forms. We use memory for column store. We use memory for disk-based indexes. What is special about in-memory OLTP is that not just that the data resides in memory, but that the data is really optimized so that Primarily, the point of this was that we could do lots of little bitty transactions, lots of little bitty modifications fast without blocks, without latches, so that blocking isn't slowing down tons of tiny inserts. Another really cool thing, something that I think I take for granted, but that is really cool, is that although things were written, like the technology was redesigned from the ground up, you don't have to create a database where only in-memory OLTP objects reside. You can modify normal databases in SQL Server and have disk-based indexes, column store indexes, which are also disk-based, but can be on in-memory OLTP as well, as well as in-memory OLTP all in the same database, and you can manage it with SQL Server Management Studio. It doesn't take special tools to manage this. So it's all integrated with the SQL Server surface area. This can be used in starting in SQL Server 2014. It's much less limited in SQL Server 2016. They added a lot more to it. And an important change is in SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 1, we got the ability to use in-memory OLTP in, quote, lower editions in SQL Server. The less expensive additions in SQL Server. So if you want to start experimenting with this, it becomes easier because one of the reasons I was really glad about this, it's not that I really want to use in-memory OLTP on web edition, but with a new feature like this where everything is completely new and completely different, we're not always that excited to go rush into changing our most critical tables and our most critical applications. When we start integrating this into an environment, we want to find places where it may make sense to use, where we can test out and see, do we get benefits, but they're on maybe like it's a logging usage where we have a way that if it goes down, our primary you know, infrastructure isn't impacted. And that's just a really, it's, it's really healthy to start experimenting with new features on less critical parts of our environment. And if we aren't lucky enough to have our whole environment on Enterprise Edition, that was really, really limiting before. Now there are some things, I mean, you have quotas on these cheaper, and I mean, cheaper, it shouldn't be in spare points there, they are literally cheaper editions of SQL Server. So we do have limits on what we can do with end memory OLTP on those, and we don't get to use resource governor. Historically, I've not been the world's biggest fan of resource governor, but for, for in memory OLTP, as well as for column store for different reasons, resource governor is really, really useful to use. For in memory OLTP, it can help you both monitor and configure how much memory is available to and, and reserved for in memory OLTP. So really, really useful feature that's still Enterprise Edition only, also accessible in Dev Edition. So it's still definitely worth, once you get to critical applications, to having Enterprise Edition. Not saying that, but uh, I'm really happy for that dipping your toe in reason and starting to get used to this reason that we can use it in other editions now. So when would we use this? In-memory OLTP was not designed as 
or is, is not, I mean, I, I'm not really thinking about the intentions of how it was designed, but this is not a replacement for all our existing stuff in SQL Server. What you want is you want a scenario where this does give you an improvement in performance. It's not gonna give you a, an improvement in performance all the time, right? Sometimes, I mean, with any change, we can make things slower. The scenarios that currently are kind of the best for, you know, possible fit for in-memory OLTP are, if I have tons of little bitty transactions and I want to insert rapidly, and that's why I kind of mentioned a logging scenario might be a non-critical dip your toe in scenario. Something like caching. Now, caching, I am like, wow, that's an expensive cache if we're paying enterprise edition. <laughs> and we have limits on how much we can cache in lower editions, but depending on your environment, sometimes these things make sense. Fast ingestion of lots of little bits of data. We have memory optimized table variables, which can get some, if you have a really high access of temporary objects, then memory optimized table variables can kind of take that out of TempDB. And it's some folks, Michael J. Swart has blogged about this, had high contention in TempDB. And one way they could resolve that is by using the memory optimized table variables. Now, Michael wrote a recent blog post that's really interesting about why it didn't end up making sense yet in their environment because they do need to support lots of little bitty databases and there is a required footprint for in-memory OLTP on their version of SQL Server that, that kind of created an issue with them. So you gotta be careful and test this out. And sometimes you find that maybe it's not a fit for you yet. Also, we get with in-memory OLTP the ability to have, this is an option, they are not all non-durable, but you can create within memory OLTP an object that if like the power gets cut on your SQL server, the data is all lost. There are some cases where we actually want this. A lot of times we're loading data and we're manipulating it. And if something goes wrong, we're just gonna restart the whole process. We don't care if the data is lost. We don't want the overhead of logging. Uh, non-logged, non-durable objects can be great for this. Aaron Stilato has written about some testing processes to see if that could be a win for some scenarios. And I would also just leave uh, the, the um, I would leave the door open for different types of things that you can imagine. So uh, Ned Otters here, Ned's worked with OLTP a bunch. He says, and memory table variable will still have the same bad cardinality assumptions. Yeah, you can use that. There's a trace flag you can use to help it get like an estimate of the number of rows in the, the table variable, but it's not necessarily going to be faster than every temp table, right? Don't, it, this is this is true for almost any feature in SQL Server. And, and when we talk about temp tables versus table variables, this comes up a lot too is one is not always faster. And that remains true for all of this stuff you may be able to engineer something really cool with this that you couldn't do with something else, but it isn't just like you swap it in and everything is faster. Um, John has a question. Does the 32 gig quota affect the buffer pool limit in SQL Server standard? So the 30, the quota for in-memory OLTP is a per database quota. And my memory, I'm going off of memory here, is that it is uh, not it is outside that buffer pool limit. The uh, blog post I have here, the link on the screen digs into that more. The XTP scenarios talks about the, those limits more. And Ned, please correct me if I'm remembering that wrong, but I believe it is per database limit and it is not within the buffer pool limit. I believe it is outside of it. I wasn't bringing that in. I don't have in memory LTP in my brain. I have to refresh everything from the cold storage. And I was mainly focusing on the isolation levels for this because today's fun is all about them isolation levels. So whatever you're testing, and I really think this is an exciting area of SQL Server to say, hey, could I engineer something really fast with this? Whatever you're testing, the, the isolation levels here can be confusing because this is really different than disk-based row store tables in SQL Server and disk-based column sort uh, in SQL Server as well. It's not bad. And I think once you start playing with it, it isn't even hard with the, the isolation levels part at least because there's only three isolation levels. There's actually fewer isolation levels. And once you get used to how they work, I think it makes sense. 
but it is really different. So it's, it's definitely worth playing around with. And most of what we're doing today is playing around with different demos. You have the demo scripts in your, oh, and that just confirmed my memory thing. <laughs> my non in memory OLTP brain uh, was correct. Not related to PowerPoint is per DB. Um, if you get into the column store index on in memory OLTP, it does count towards the per DB cap. So that's an extra layer of rocket science that you can play around with. So today we're going to dig through these demos. Be talking about different kinds of transactions and why you should care. What trend, what isolation level escalation is and why you should care. And I, this is one of those things that if you take care of it, you don't necessarily have to worry about it later. What is an uncommittable transaction and why is that a good thing? Snapshot isolation and multi-statement transactions. Then we'll, the other two, our three isolation levels we get are snapshot, repeatable read, and serializable. And we'll see demos of why you might want repeatable read and serializable. And then finally, we'll close with a stupid pet trick and then we'll do a recap. So in the demos today, I am only doing these in interpreted T-SQL. In other words, I am not creating a bunch of natively compiled procedures. I do not mean that natively compiled procedures aren't cool though. In fact, natively compiled procedures, when you can use them, can be incredibly fast. But we can only access in memory tables from natively compiled procedures. There's limitations on what we can do. And I'm talking about being creative and exploring. So we are exploring in interpreted T-SQL doing cross container stuff today. I have a link if you want to learn more about what this cross container means. Just, just please know that even though I'm not showing you natively compiled procedures, they are really interesting. They are really cool. You should explore with them. We just want to play around with isolation levels today. So let's dig in now to our SQL Server instance here and bring up our virtual machine. I'm doing this on SQL Server 2017 today. So here we are in Management Studio. I am going to need a second Management Studio later. So I will just go ahead and get it open now. Let's make this 100% font and connect up our second instance and then we will be all sorts of ready to go. We are on line 208 in the script. Before this, I have done all sorts of setup. I have restored a tiny database called Babby Names. I have configured it for in-memory OLTP. I have created some tables that we're gonna use and I have loaded them. I have set up Resource Governor. You can use the script for download to explore all of that stuff. We just don't have time to show it all today. So I did all that stuff. I baked that cake before we started. The first weird thing that can be confusing with in-memory OLTP is that what look like very similar transactions can behave very differently by default. So right, this query select counts are from ref.firstname XTP. I put XTP on the end of my in-memory OLTP tables just to make it totally obvious that it's an in-memory table for the purpose of demo. You don't have to do that. But like, right, this is the same query. The only difference is I have it in an explicit transaction in number two. In the first example, this is going to be an auto committed transaction. I haven't explicitly said begin tran, but it's going to run that way. When I run the first statement, it works fine, right? No errors. I have 95,025 rows in the ref.firstname XTP table. But if I put an explicit transaction around <laughs> that same query, I get an error. And the error is actually very clear, which, you know, at least yay for clear errors. It says accessing memory optimized tables using the read committed isolation level. My default isolation level in SQL Server is read committed that, and I don't have read committed snapshot enabled for this database. So I'm by default, I'm in read committed. It says it's only supported for those auto commit transactions. It is not supported for explicit or implicit transactions. I need to provide a supported isolation level using a table hint and 
it's you even go so far as to suggest it's like a waiter. Perhaps you would like to use a with snapshot hint. Well, that's interesting. I need to tell it to use snapshot isolation. And you might wonder from that error message, you know, it says explicit or implicit transaction. You might be like, okay, what is the difference between auto commit and implicit? Implicit transactions, I have hardly ever seen people using this in SQL Server, but this is what it is. You can change this setting and say set implicit transactions on for my session, and then you can run the query. What this essentially does is it secretly puts in a begin tran commit around whatever I run. So it implicitly does that begin tran, and I get the same error message as I do for the explicit transaction. So I'm just, I'm not saying you should use this. Very few people do. I'm just showing you so the error message makes sense. Robert says the sound is choppy. Um, other folks, could you let me know if you're having the same issue? If not, then Robert reconnecting might do it for you. The internet is a cruel place for <laughs> live audio. So hopefully my internet is doing okay. Uh, other folks are saying it's doing all right. So Robert, if you reconnect, hopefully you'll you'll get on a better whatever in the GoToWebinar cloud. Sorry about that. So I went, I, I had to turn my implicit transactions off to return to normal. And I can, I can turn it off as often as I want. So what about these auto commit transactions? Let's look at them a little bit. I do want to just show you and prove here the settings for my database because this this is one of the things that really confused me at first. I can look at from sys databases the settings for snapshot isolation, read committed snapshot, and this one we're going to talk about, whether or not elevation to snapshots on. So currently in my database that we're using, I have not enabled snapshot isolation. This have you enabled snapshot? This is the setting we got in SQL Server 2005 when we got snapshot isolation for disk-based tables. They were all we had. <laughs> and that snapshot isolation uses versioning in TempDB, right? So I have not turned on TempDB versioning. And I want you to read this as snapshot isolation using TempDB versioning when you use this setting, even though that's not what it says. Similarly, I'm not doing read committed snapshot or RCSI in TempDB. And I'm currently not elevating explicit and implicit transactions to snapshot. The, one of the confusing things to me was just, can I tell? So what it's telling me is auto commit transactions started and read committed are being elevated to snapshot. Now I don't, what the, part of the confusion was, do I have to enable snapshot isolation for this database, that old 2005 version? And then can I even see that they're using snapshot? Well, let's go ahead and I'm just running this query over and over and over again here. So while one equals one, just keep running this query. And while it's running, I'm going to go into another window and use Atom Mechanics SP who is active, which is the, a great procedure. You can get it at whoisactive.com for free. It's a great way to see what's running in your SQL Server. And I've said get additional info as one because I want to see information like the transaction isolation level. And this is completely accurate. The session that I'm running that interpreted T SQL in is in read committed. The statement is sort of secretly getting a with snapshot hint tacked onto it, but that doesn't change the transaction isolation level for the, the session at all. Even if I do things like get plan equals one, an execution plan, and I need plural, an execution plan isn't super, it isn't concerned about transaction isolation. This is just about optimization. I don't see any hints tacked on here about with snapshot. I can't tell from just looking at the query that this is anything different than plain old vanilla read committed. Right, so that's not really, like if you were to just come across this, you wouldn't be like, oh, that snapshot isolation. You have to actually play around with this. And no, we can prove though, or at least demonstrate the effect of snapshot isolation. 
one of the things that you, we can do with disk-based tables, and I'm going to go ahead and pop this query in here and uncomment it. With disk-based tables, if I do this demo and I go to, on a disk-based table I, with first names in it, this, this table has a lot of names in it, and on a disk-based row store index on first name, I do have a, an index on first name, you're going to see I force it to use it. If I take the row Aben, which is the first row that's in here, and I update it to Zabin, it bounces to the end of that index. And if I'm reading it in read committed, if I read it over and over while it's bouncing to the one side of the index and then the other and then the other and then the other on a disk-based B-tree index, sometimes I'll count it twice, sometimes I won't see it at all. And that's real easy to demo. So what I'm going to show is using supposedly read committed, right? That what we know and what we're going to prove is that with snapshot secretly being added on here, this query we're selecting the name count from ref.firstnamexcp. I'm forcing it to use an index on the table that I created that's on first name. And if I look at my execution plan, I can even see, yeah, I'm doing an index scan on first name XTP. What we're going to do is while we're updating the name and it's not bouncing back and forth is the thing, because the thing, this is an in-memory index. This isn't the same old B tree. Updates don't modify a row and move it back and forth in in-memory OLTP. Up, we're just adding new information with timestamps so SQL Server can figure out what's current. This isn't happening in TempDB. This is a whole new way of the table working, right? So I am, when I'm running these updates, I'm actually adding new stuff and with timestamps about what the current information is. So here we go, we are updating, <laughs> which is really uh, just adding new stuff. And then while that happens, I'm going to count how many first names there are 2,000 times. And oh, I want to do this without execution plans on because that'll tank my management studio. So we have a table that we've created called name count, and we're counting how many rows are in there. If we were really in read committed, we would see three different numbers result from this because sometimes we would miss a name as it was bouncing back and forth in that that B tree index and sometimes we would count it twice but now we just have inserts we don't have updates happening so let's actually while it's we're at about 30 seconds here I have SP who is active hot keyed in here so we can actually watch it as it runs and we can see that see there was no there's no blocking we are we are still sometimes having to wait on those updates. And memory OLTP does still have to talk to my transaction log, and I am still having some waits on that, but I'm not having block waits going on here, right? So what I'm running here is SP who is active. I just had it hotkeyed, and we finished up there. All right, so what? how many names did we count? If we always see 95,025 names, yeah, we are not, you know, clearly in plain old recommitted. It's just not using TempDB to do it. The lowest isolation level that we can have with memory optimized tables is snapshot, and that with snapshot hint is getting added on. Well, what about explicit transactions? I'm going to review again. I haven't changed any of my settings, right? I have not enabled elevation the tempdb version of snapshot isolation still off here's that error i get from the explicit transaction and it suggests that i add this with snapshot hint it's like you might like to have with snapshot well okay let's go ahead and do that and sure enough that works the table hint with snapshot works now if you're like me you might have thought, well, another way I could do this is, right, if I a table hint of with snapshot works, maybe I can just set the isolation level of snapshot for my session, and then I don't have to do all those table hints. Well, take a look at this. In fact, no, this is part of why it's confusing. Memory, it, it gives me very clear error. 
it says you can't use this session based memory optimized tables and natively compiled modules cannot be accessed or created when you're using session based snapshot. You, the snapshot has to happen as a table hint, not a session hint. And there are reasons for that. I'm going to give you a link to Kaylin Delaney's white paper. And she explains there's a very complicated chart. It has to do with if you're accessing disk based stuff and you're accessing in memory stuff, you need to have a single timestamp to refer to. And because of the different ways they work, session level snapshot just doesn't work. So we have to go back to read committed for our session. So it wants the hint, not the session level. If we don't want to type all those hints, here's how we avoid typing all those hints. We say alter database. I am using alter database current, which we got in SQL Server 2012. You could put the database name there. Set memory optimized snapshot. Set memory optimized elevate to snapshot on. So now we can see that property in our database that I do have elevation enabled. And now that I've set this on my database, I can now run begin tran, right, without that hint, and it automatically says, oh, that's an in memory table. I will add that hint for you. But it is adding that essentially that with snapshot hint invisibly in there to make it all work. So what about, what does snapshot isolation give us for this? Well, this, so this example, crappy code, but just for illustration purposes, we're going to talk about getting a seat on an airplane. And I'm creating a, a table named seat assignments XTP. It has uh, seats who they're assigned to. And just for fun, we're doing some system versioning on the table. You can do versioning on in-memory OLTP tables. The history table is a disk-based table. There's lots of info on that online. So I'm just doing that for fun so we can see it. We're going to put 1,000 seats into the table. And then we're going to upload. Let's say all the seats are assigned except for one. So let's take a look at our seats. There's one seat left. It's in the front of the airplane. And we want to get this seat. The code we have to get the seats is very simple. And this is, you know, this is just as crappy as the table design. <laughs> we get, we pass in the seat and the assignee. And we are doing an explicit transaction. This, this is not a memory optimized store procedure. This is interpreted T SQL in a procedure. It will be automatically escalated. I'm doing an update. And then I do a commit. So I want to reserve my seat. And our question is, what, what happens if we have a race condition where I'm reserving my seat and somebody else comes in and tries to update while I'm committing my transaction? So to simulate this, what we're going to do is use the TC will debugger. I am trying to get seat 1A. So I'm going to say step into. And I'm going to step into this procedure. There's the begin tran. Now we're on the update. And on, while I'm on the commit, stopped at this point where we are trying to commit our data. And while this is happening, I go ahead and close out this window because we don't need it anymore. While this is happening, someone else tries to reserve a seat in our other management studio session. So I'm going to connect to the database. There we go, we will uncomment. So while I'm committing my transaction, Nanners, my old cat, tries to get the seat as well. And she's not debugging, she's just going straight through. So she's gonna go through the update and hit the commit. And when she tries to commit her seat, she gets an error. And this is, this is a feature. I firmly believe this is a feature. Here is the error. Here's the number. It's Going back to the beginning, it's 41302. I tried to update a record that has been updated since this transaction started. Like, right, I'm trying to modify a record that uh, someone else has, has modified. They're in the process of commit, but like 
I'm trying to change data that's been modified since my transaction started. It is not safe to change that data. This, I had to bail out. This is an uncommittable transaction and it has been rolled back. So this is actually a good thing. You want to catch this error and be like, oh, I need to actually either probably not retry in this case, maybe recheck if the seat's available because in theory, the other transaction could roll back too. But like this seat is not safe to reserve for Nanners because Kendar is in the process of committing the seat. In in-memory OLTP at commit time, it does validation as well as write all the data. And I am sitting in my commit. It's not safe for anybody. She can't commit this row. And that's a good thing, right? Because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to have me commit to the seat and then have her grab the seat from me when it wasn't available uh, for her. So going back to my session, right, looking at our, right, because assigned to our query set, assigned to is null, right? And I am committing, I am, I'm getting that seat. <laughs> so I finish up, I get my seat, my query is executed successfully, I have one row affected, and when we look at the, you know, table, yep, I have the seat. The seat is assigned to me. We can even use the history. We can use the versioning of this table. I'm going to now say, look at the history of this. Was there ever a time? I mean, her Nanner's transaction aborted. But was there ever a time when the seat was assigned to anyone else from me, except for me? And we can see looking at the history of that seat, for system time all for seat 1A, no, this was only ever assigned to me. So that commit violation is, is a useful thing. That's like, don't look at these errors as like, oh, it's a problem I have to handle those errors. The errors are there for a reason and, and they're trying to be useful for you because I don't want her stealing my seat. Now, there's lots of things my code doesn't do, right? <laughs> This is obviously not modeling code for anything you'd actually want to do, but I just like that example for kind of showing with race conditions who gets the seat. What if I'm using snapshot and I have more than one statement in the transaction? How does snapshot work? And this is part of what, like with disk-based tables, with snapshot isolation, when you're, you know, and the way I usually do it with this based tables is I usually do set transaction isolation level snapshot for my whole session. And then I start a transaction. And with that, the, you get a snapshot of the data, not from the time you run begin trend, but from the time you do the first data access, you get the same view for the whole transaction, which can be useful for reporting because let's say, I have started a lemonade stand for, and all of the, the babies, this is this database contains all the baby names in the United States. Let's say all, a lot of those babies are going to be running lemonade stands for me. I have this great franchising business. And um, I need to use memory optimized tables because there's, there's just so many babies selling lemonade. So we're going to create our lemonade stand revenue XTP table. And we're not going to include the comment ending in the definition. So we're actually going to create the table. I have to, on a memory optimized table, I always have to have a primary key. It has to be non-clustered. There's no such thing as a clustered index. Whole brave new world, right? So I said with memory optimized is on. And right now I, I only have, you know, a limited number of revenue reps. <laughs> we're starting small. But we expect this to be extremely fast in the future. So I've got 2015, 2016, 2017, and my total revenue is 30 bucks. We're doing really well here. And we've got this report on our lemonade stand. The top is a summary query, right? So we're selecting our total revenue. And then at the bottom, we have detail. And what we're going to do is we're going to test out what happens if in the middle of our report, the data changes. So first run, we're just going to run our report with no data changing at all. So what does our report look like just by default? So as we would expect, our total revenue is 30. And then here's our detail. So let's say we're running our report. I keep collapsing it. There we go. We're, we start our report. And it, it runs the summary bit. But before, it can run the detail bit 
some data comes in, an update and an insert come in. So in another window, and then let's, uh, there we go, let's fix our indenting. In another window, we've, we've run the first part of our report, which is just automatically escalated to snapshot based on my database setting. So meanwhile, an insert and an update happen, and uh, for 2017, my revenue is adjusted to 100, and then revenue of one comes in for 2014. So our total is no longer 30. We have an extra row, and one of our rows has changed for 2017. When we run now the select portion of our report, we don't see the 100. We don't see the row for 2014. Just, I mean, snap, this, this is snapshot isolation working the same way. It sees a snapshot from the first time we accessed data in the transaction, and we see data consistent with that. Now I commit, and it completes successfully. So this is, in many cases, this is going to be exactly what we want, because we want consistency with the first time data access occurs in the transaction. But there might be some cases where we don't want this because what if we want to make sure like what if we want to make sure that at the time the report commits at the time of the report is actually given back and returned to the user it has current data because in fact right these the insert and the update had committed there's going to be some cases where we want the most recent stuff we don't want the snapshot from when data access started. And we want to say, oh, if anything's changed, let me know so I can actually redo it. Because I, it's not gonna go back and run this first query for me, but I might want it to, get, to give me an error and let me know, hey, something changed. Isolation levels can help with this. So our lowest isolation level we can use with end memory is snapshot. We can raise one level to repeatable read. And repeatable read says, if any of the rows that you have read, if like if I read them again and I wouldn't read the exact same thing at the time of commit, I'll throw an error. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a read set and look to see if any of those rows have changed. So let's reset the table. Oh, we can't, yeah, we, there, it, it, it's different though. I mean like, so when you look at this, you're like, oh, truncate table isn't allowed, but this is a whole new different world. It's not like delete is, if we delete all the rows or recreate the table, it's not like running through a disk-based index in the same way. So it stores it differently. We can do delete from. Interesting discussion as to whether it would be better to delete all rows or recreate the table. Not covering that today, but test whenever you need to do something like this and see what's better for you at volume. Now I'm going to go ahead and just reinsert my row. So we're back to the original, the original revenue for our massive lemonade stand. And now I have just put a repeatable read hint on the first query. I'm going to start up my report and I, I get the summary amount at the top. And now I'm just, I'm just going to run the update statement. I'm not doing the insert. I'm just going to do the update for 2017. And repeatable read catches that. What repeatable read doesn't catch is inserts. It doesn't catch what's called phantom rows. This is a change to an existing row that I read. I didn't read this row because it, it, you know, like, well, I haven't run the insert, but if I had run it, it wouldn't have been there at the time I ran my summary query. So I modified a row that this read, and now I can run this select query at the end. That will return the detailed data. And again, it uses the snapshot. I get everything from snapshot. But at the time I hit commit here, it says, oh, something changed in the read set. You used repeatable read on that first query. And I went and validated what you read. And like something in there is different at the time of commit. So you may want to go check what's going on and rerun that report because you don't have the most current data. That's a feature. That's a cool feature. If I was to, if I redo this and I only run the insert statement, let's reset our table, right? Repeatable read doesn't catch the insert statement. So I'm going to do begin tran, do this summary with repeatable read, and then I'm going to do the insert. Now, 
Now, I haven't changed any of the rows that I read. Now it works just fine on the commit because it says, oh, I checked the rows you read. Those rows are still the same. If I want to catch that insert, I need to use serializable isolation level. Serializable includes repeatable read protection. It, it gives us everything from snapshot. It validates that if we read the rows we read, they would be read again. And it says, okay, no phantom rows have been inserted that if you were to run the query again, you would now read them. So I'm going to reset my table. I'm going to start up my transaction with serializable. And now I'm going to just run the update, right? I'm using serializable, not repeatable read. While I was doing this, a row was updated. And when I go to commit, it says, it, it, I'm using serializable, but serializable includes repeatable reads. So the error message does tell me which type of failure it was, which type it found first a problem with. If I now rerun this and just run the insert, we're going to reset the table and now do the summary transaction. Meanwhile, an insert comes in for 2014, which is before the period I read. It's not even in the middle of the period. Now when I go, it says, oh, your query would have picked up another row, and this is a serializable validation feature. So if I do need to make sure that nothing has changed, that if I were to run my select query at the top again, that it would return the same stuff, I really want to be in serializable isolation level. We do have time for a stupid pet trick. I'm really pleased. <laughs> this is a bonus. Oddly enough, the no lock hint is allowed with in memory OLTP. No other locking hints are allowed. You can't use like it, you can't use Xbox. It doesn't use locking. You can't, you can't, you know, tell it row lock or anything like that. But you can do no lock, which is, I wonder if it's a joke. I don't really know. It seems like a joke to me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start our report. Right, and the beginning of the report, I haven't put any hints on there, right? We're just returning the summary data. What we're gonna do is we're gonna now create, we're gonna change some of the data here, right? I'm gonna update that row, I'm gonna insert a row. And then our second statement in the report uses a no lock hint. And the question is, like, this seems like what it would do is override the snapshot that, you know, we're automatically getting elevated to snapshot. This seems like it might, and I don't know why I have two, <laughs> two semicolons there, like just for emphasis maybe. This seems like it would be like, oh, maybe we could see those rows that were modified because maybe the no lock cancels out the snapshot. The no lock can't, let's go ahead and run this. It does not see the updated row for 2017. It does not see the uh, row we inserted for 2014. The no lock hint is quietly ignored, is the way Kaylin Delaney puts it in her white, her excellent white paper on in memory OLTP. So maybe this is a feature meant to be that, like, if you have existing code, you don't have to clean out the no lock hints. I kind of, like, really, you don't want to port existing code. Like, if you're lazy enough to not remove your no lock hints, you really shouldn't be using in memory OLTP. <laughs> Like, this is not the feature for you if you need to save time to that level. So, it's more of a stupid pet trick than anything else, I think. But in fact, the no lock hint is allowed. Uh, trivia for you at, if you go to any sort of conference where they do DBA trivia, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, no lock hint is allowed. So, let's do a quick recap of what we covered in our isolation level adventure there. There are three isolation levels allowed within memory OLTP. The lowest level is snapshot. If you do auto commit transactions, if you start playing around with this, you may not realize you need to do anything special because little auto commit transactions are automatically elevated to snapshot. But as soon as you do a begin tran, or if you're one of the rare people who use implicit transactions, you may start getting errors that in fact, oh, you need to add a with snapshot hint. That is in fact a table with snapshot hint. It's not the session level hint. The easiest way to handle this is to alter the database and set 
elevation on for those explicit transactions because not a lot of people use implicit transactions. Snapshot, that table level snapshot hint is good for a lot of scenarios. If you want to make sure that at the time of commit, no rows have changed, rows that you read have changed, you want to use repeatable read isolation, it gives you that additional protection. If further, you want to make sure that not only have no rows that I have read, not only have they not changed, but also like no phantom, we <laughs> little ghost right? no phantom rows popped in, that if you were to run your queries again, they would have been touched by your query. If you want to make sure those phantoms didn't pop in, then you need, you need serializable isolation. This is the most isolated your transaction can be from the impacts of other transactions. And if it detects any phantoms, you'll get the serializable validation level. I really love Kaylin Delaney's white paper. Um, here is a short link to that white paper. And I showed just one little bit of potential failure here, right? I showed you the uncommittable transactions. I showed you the transaction violations. There are other examples of different errors that can happen with the error numbers, things you need to think about, things you need to catch, as well as just a huge amount of information on how this all works, which is really helpful to know. I believe Kaylin's book, um, updated book on in-memory OLTP for 2016 is out as well. So you can check that out. Also, start with the white paper. It's free. It's shorter. Like it's not, I mean, this thing is something you can actually read and consume. <laughs> it's, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it's, I think it's actually really readable. Kaylin writes in a really approachable style. So I highly recommend that white paper. And even, I mean, I used it for, I mean, things like that no lock hint, where like, okay, is it actually just ignored or is something else going on? The white paper confirms, yes, it is quietly ignored. So lots of info that I really love to learn by testing, but you also want to find out, okay, is this by design? And, you know, is, am I right? Is, am I correct from what I'm learning from my tests? So it's always great to have these sources. That is an official Microsoft white paper. There's another interesting post that I thought about demoing but didn't have time. Uh, you can do foreign keys with memory optimized table. In fact, the demo script you have today has some foreign keys in it. This is a really interesting post by uh, Denzel Ribeiro about uh, validation, area, validation errors with tables with foreign keys and how proper indexing can help minimize those validations by limiting the read set in some cases. Really uh, fun. If you like isolation levels, it's fun. I really like isolation levels. But if you're using this, then very important if you're using the foreign keys uh, post read. I have two more webcasts uh, this year. Oh, okay. So uh, Ned says, I just wanted to say that some of what's in the white paper is dated, i.e. the max amount of in-memory data, et cetera. Do you mean because it's been changed in 2017? The white paper is, and yeah, I should have mentioned this, the white paper is for SQL Server 2016. We have SQL Server 2017 and more improvements and enhancements have been added in 2017. What I should do also, let me make a quick note, is in the follow-up email for this, I want to add a link for the what's new in uh, 2017 page in Books Online. Because um, that'll help cover the what's changed and what's new. I believe, Ned, uh, Michael talks about this as well, uh, Swart in his uh, recent article about the Table variables, the footprint required for the databases, I believe, has been reduced in 2017. And I think that was an RTM. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Ned said the white paper was written before RTM. Oh, okay. So, some of the 2016 things, um, uh, such as, it, so even for 2016, no max amount of memory, only limited to OS memory, hasn't been changed. You think that. The Microsoft folks would just quickly update the white paper because Kaylin is super diligent about that stuff. But such is the world of publishing um, that it's difficult with these things. So, okay, so I will now include the link to what's new in 2017 as well as 2016. <laughs> so it's always fun using a, a rapidly evolving technology because it really is always a research project. And this isn't just in memory OLTP. This 
also has to do with column store. Like with column store, when I was like doing testing on the rebuild reorganize um, options, there was a whole um, there's a page in books online on like, okay, how do I deal with um, maintaining column store indexes? And it didn't even mention one of the big features in 2017. That's like, it, it, so yeah, the, even Microsoft documentation may not, it's hard for it to keep up with the rate of release. This is a good problem to have because it's because the rate of release is so fast. I'm not, I don't want to come, I don't want to say we should slow down the rate of release and wait on the documentation, but it does mean that you've now got to look at, okay, what are all the blog posts as well as what are all the white papers and things like that. So it's now 9.51. I'm looking to see if folks have questions or comments, but if, if you don't, you get nine minutes back potentially before your next meeting. So feel free if you don't have a question or comment to bail out, refresh that coffee, take a walk before your uh, next meeting or grab these scripts. The link is in the uh, chat window as well as in the answer question. Grab the scripts and just start playing around with this. If you're not, if you're like, oh, I don't have an instance to play around with this on, I would really encourage you to just for a scratch sandbox, it, sandbox instance. This actually wasn't what I was demoing on today, but one of the things I like to use is just a real quick Docker install. I have a video on SQLWorkbooks.com showing just how fast it is to deploy those. And so if you don't want to have like a permanent 2017 instance around, and developer edition is free, so you could just do a permanent 2017 instance. I'm not dissuading you from that, but if you also just want like a sandbox, to going through the effort to figure out how to set up just a real quick Docker download of latest and install and set up. Like it just means that at any time you can really quickly do that and then play around with something and then get rid of it and it's gone. So I like that. You don't have to do it that way, of course. Um, Sean says, don't tell my boss I have nine extra minutes. Yeah, no one tell. <laughs> it's a total secret. So a couple folks saying, thanks. I'm so glad that you enjoyed this. Thanks for coming. Alan says, will you be presenting at SQL Bits in London next year? I will not be at SQL Bits next year. I do love London. I do love SQL Bits. It's not that I don't love it. It's just next year didn't work out for me. And I want to, what I've decided I want to do, actually, I don't think I've told anyone this, but it's not like it's a big secret. I finally made the decision. I was like, yeah, I think I want to do a day long session on isolation levels. And if you've been watching the webcast, I've done a webcast, I've been preparing this material on, you know, why is read committed? Not everything we want it to be, like what can go wrong in read committed? Uh, snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot. Now I'm starting to build this end memory OLTP piece. And I do touch on column store and the other modules as well. And then coming up on December 14, I'll be talking about serializable and repeatable read in the context of disk based tables. So kind of adding to that piece and a lot of people inherit databases that maybe they're a vendor database maybe it's a legacy database that's using serializable and they don't even realize it and then they start hitting locking problems and whoa what's going on with this uh, i do want to add some more modules like um maybe some examples with replication subscribers and different isolation levels ned says thanks for presenting on my favorite topic it's kind of I, isolation levels and indexes which is my favorite i don't know they're they may both be my favorite so I don't know, I just, is OLTP, is in-memory OLTP your favorite topic rather than isolation levels? <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> yes, he says yes. In-memory OLTP is not yet my favorite topic. I find it really intriguing now. Like it's really, to me, it's really interesting. I'm super glad that it's now available in standard edition and web edition just for that, like, because if I was still a production DBA, I would totally be like, now this available in cheaper editions, like, okay, where can I play around with this? But if it explodes, like, it's no big thing because I want to get ahead, you know, I, and I may not be able to use it in um, critical stuff soon, just depending on what things my environment is on. But how can I learn as much as I can about this so that I can identify places where this may work and I can learn how to manage it. I can figure out the nature of this beast. So I'm really glad that they did that. Um, Ned says it's a study unto itself. Um, yes, <laughs> everything is different. I was, 
lucky enough to get to go to um, Kaylin's. Kaylin Delaney did a pre-con day on in memory OLTP. I think it was called What the Hecaton. And I got to attend that in Portugal. And it was like entering, I mean, this is kind of the cool thing about it, is spending time on in memory OLTP is like entering a totally different world of SQL Server, but in our familiar SQL Server databases. And you get to just totally, it's, it's, it's like everything's a different color. You know what I mean? You just, and you get to sort of explore it and you find everything's different. You know, you have to learn to relax a lot of your assumptions, like clustered indexes exist. No, they don't exist. And then you're like, well, how does it work? And it's, it's crazy. So it's really fun. Uh, it's really interesting. <laughs> Simon says, OLTP is a great topic. It's great to chat up girls, see how they swoon. So I don't know if you saw the um, Rima Nime, uh meme that she used, Dr. Nime, and hopefully I'm saying her name right, she did a, a, what do you call it, a morning talk, a conference, you know, keynote at the past conference this year, and one of the slides she has was like a meme, and it was about, you know, one of the impressive things at parties is to talk about what is, I don't know how many different isolation levels, basically, that there are with Cosmos database. But yeah, at the right party <laughs> or at the right job interview, more likely. Uh, the, the original reason that I started learning about isolation levels in SQL Server was that I had a particularly disastrous job interview for, I was interviewing for a job that I really wanted. I thought it was my dream job. And I, like at one point, one interview, it went so badly. <laughs> I was the total wrong person for this job. At one point I was asked just to name the isolation levels in SQL Server. And I was just like, no luck. <laughs> I mean, I did a little better than that. But after that, after that interview, which really did humble me on many topics <laughs> and humility is good. I was like, you know, maybe I should learn about those because I really feel like I should be able to answer that question better. And thus, I started learning about isolation levels. Uh, <laughs> Simon is working on his isolation level pickup lines. Do not use those in job interviews. <laughs> that's, that's my biggest piece of advice today. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining me. This has been so much fun. Um, and I'll be back on December 7th talking about indexing for windowing functions. We will be back in the world of disk-based bee tree tables, <laughs> disk-based row store tables. The terminology is so funny where I'm just like, oh, wait, no, is, there are still, and I, I may have kind of slipped up on this, that the proper terminology is our old tables are disk-based row store, and we have in-memory OLTP, and then we have column store, and column store is usually disk-based unless we are combining it with in-memory OLTP. So hopefully I got the terminology. Thank you all for joining. Have a great week, and I will see you soon. Bye. Maybe I'll figure out how to turn it off. <laughs>